you need to educate the news broadcasters. Because whether you like it or not, they have a lot of influence on how these news that are happening in crypto get <laughs> to the mainstream audience. But if the news, which is the amplifier, is well educated, they have one last excuse of calling Celsius DeFi. Hello, everyone. This is Mena, your crypto friend. Today, I'm really thrilled to have Mauricio Magaldi as my guest. Mauricio is also a Web3 podcaster. His main audience base is in Latin America. He originally comes from Brazil and currently lives in UK. Let's welcome him. Welcome to my channel, Mauricio. <laughs> Finally, we got connected. I mean, we got connected like a month ago, but I know you yeah. have been moving from Brazil to UK. How, how was the move? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been um, mostly uneventful, but there's still a lot to be uh, arranged. It's like trying to do all the paperwork of an English person within three weeks, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lifetime worth of paperwork. So yeah, uh, interesting process. Um, but I'm glad like you moved uh, smoothly. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It was, it's, it's been, it's been all right. Family uh, still to come, but uh, when they, when they arrive, I think everything's going to be properly set up for them. Can you please give a brief introduction to yourself as well as the Vlog Jobs podcast you have been working on? Yeah, thank you. So my name is Mauricio Magaldi. Um, I've been in financial services for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I started my time as a podcaster, <laughs> if I can be called that, in December 2019, after I left IBM, where I was the head of blockchain services for Latin America for a couple of years. And I didn't want to lose contact with the community. Um, the blockchain community was always very welcoming. Um, I made really good friends and I just wanted to keep in touch with everyone. So I love the podcast format. So I, I started looking for a podcast in Portuguese um, that could keep me abreast of everything that was going on in the industry. And I'm very interest, very much interested in use cases. And I at, at that point, um, I couldn't find a podcast that was analyzing the use cases in the blockchain, crypto, yeah. DeFi industry. And I thought, well, how hard can it be to record a podcast? <laughs> Just the audio. And, and when I went to a, uh, an event in November of that year, I, after the panel I did about blockchain applied to creative industries, I was invited with my co-panelist to record a podcast episode for, for a show. Mm. And then I saw the process of recording and I was like, hmm, I've been in music for, you know, most of my life. I think I can handle recording a podcast. <laughs> wow. And, um, and then I came back to Sao Paulo. I started researching. I spoke to a friend who's, who runs a studio and he said, well, you need to buy a Zoom recorder. And I said, what is a I, Zoom recorder? Yeah, a Zoom record. Zoom is the brand. Uh, record is a di they 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 produce digital recorders. Oh, okay. Um, they're very they're, they're very very good, but they're like really professional grade. And I was not trying to spend any money doing what I was going to do yeah. just to test if it you know it was going to work. So I ran into a um, an app that allowed me to record, edit, assembly. Um, put the sound, the, the, back, the background sound and uh, sound bites, publish it and track it. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna do that out of the phone. So I started recording uh, in the garage of my building at 7 a.m. every Saturday in my car because that was the best acoustic I could get with the, uh, with the uh, speaker mm. uh, phone and microphone from the cell phone. And interestingly enough, I recorded a trailer and I said that Blockchops would be a weekly digest. 
And I didn't realize that that would require me to have a weekly commitment to it <laughs> when I recorded. But you said it. So, yeah, I, I just said it. And, and, and then I said, well, now I have to honor this. And yeah. since the second to last week of December 2019, I have recorded either one or two episodes of Block Drops every week. Uh, for over a year, I did both the Portuguese episode and the English episode because after a year or so doing the podcast, people started asking, when are you going to record the English version? And I was like, I'm not. I, that's not what the show was thought to be. And then uh, mm -hmm. someone reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, hey, I'm downloading your audio, passing it through text to, uh, speech to text, then translating the text so I can understand what you're saying. And I felt oh, wow. that was kind of a lot of work uh, for like a 20 minute podcast. So I, um, I started doing that in English. But recently, as I took over um, the uh, Blockchain Insider podcast that we do here at 11FS, um, I stopped doing block drops in English because then it's just too much work. It's just a lot of work to put two, two shows um, out every week and every other week. Um, it takes a lot of time. So yeah. in time that I don't have. So. Uh, we're just simplifying things. So my all my, my all my content in English is now 11FS uh, branded and block drops, you know, returned to be what it was initially designed to be, which is a, a podcast in Portuguese about blockchain for business. Yeah, I think weekly commitment for podcasts is really a lot of work, even though maybe people, they think, oh, it's just weekly updates. But for us, preparing the content, collecting all the information, filming it, editing it, it's it's very time consuming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't do video exactly for that reason. First, because I'm not <laughs> great with video. I I I do all my editing, so I I'm I don't know how to edit video. I'm I'm okay with audio. I've been doing you know I've been playing bands for thirty years now, so that's fine. But video is not you know uh, something that I have any domain and I don't intend to do that right now. Um, so I do only the audio, but still, I mean, you have to uh, script it, you have to curate the news, you have to read everything because one of the things that prompted me to start the podcast was that I wanted to study and learn in front of other people. Because when you have mm -hmm. to tell people and, and, and instruct and educate them about something, if you don't understand, it doesn't fit five minutes. So every drop uh, on the show is up to five minutes. And it, it kind of keeps me on my toes, right? If I get mm -hmm. through, say, to explain some use case that's weird and complicated, if I can make it work in five minutes, that means that I understood what that is about. Um, so that kind of mm -hmm. forces me to be very concise and actually understand what I'm talking about. You're right. Doing videos is more complicated than oh. doing audio. There are I, like I, so many. I'm 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 never doing video for myself. We do we do it at 11 FS because we have a magical uh, media team that takes care of every every aspect, and we have, you know, the whole infrastructure to run it. Personally, mm -hmm. I I have no desire to actually spend my time <laughs> editing video. That's not the best use of my time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Would you say like the majority of your audience currently are Brazilian? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Because since uh, five weeks ago, I uh, stopped doing the English version, um, mm. which which is which is fine. I mean, I'm I'm not. It was never supposed to be in English in the first place. I just did it because you know there was the whole circumstance. Um, mm. But I mostly focus on bringing global news to my audience, obviously to to study. Um, mm. And also to highlight things that are happening in Brazil that are mm -hmm. of interest uh, for the Brazilian community. Mm. So, yeah, it's pretty much local. Um, sometimes I, I see um, some plays coming from other uh, Portuguese speaking countries like Portugal, some of the former Portugal colonies, even some Spanish uh, uh, speaking countries will pick it up because there's uh, similarities between Portuguese and Spanish. Yeah, yeah, I learned both Spanish and Portuguese, so I know they're, <laughs> but, but now I don't speak any, so <laughs> don't test me on that. <laughs> I won't, I won't, no, but that, yeah, that's, that's the, um, that's kind of the audience, and, and um, 
the the local community in Brazil is really really booming. Like there's a lot of great people, a lot of great communities. Uh, we have DAOs, mm -hmm. we have um, companies. It, it's one of the countries with uh, probably the largest number of um, new and upcoming um, crypto exchanges, for instance. So I think there's a lot of growth in, in Brazil that still needs to happen. Um, and I think yeah. the communities are handling the education of the market really well. Um, Regulatory landscape is a little bit controversial, but yeah. there's progress. So I think, yeah, uh, all in all, um, you know, I think it's a, a booming market that has yet to be tapped um, in its entirety. I think the 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 Brazil market is very interesting because uh, I did consulting services for Brazil market before, and. Um, I mean, before I didn't know a lot of things about Brazil, but after working with a client, right, in the financial services, I feel like Brazil is very fast to adapt, adopt the newest technology, and you guys are very willing to try new things. Like even though maybe like regulatory or uh, political reasons, but still it's better than the remaining of the world. Because <laughs> we got, for example, in the US, People got more rules here <laughs> and more problems here. Would you would you agree to that statement? Or yeah, you... I've yeah, I, I covered Latin America for uh, a number of years uh, when I worked at IBM, and in comparison with Asia, for instance, mm. um, Japan, uh, APAC, um, some of the islands, um, I think Brazil lags a lot behind those countries because. There's always someone in Latin America asking who else in the world is doing this. So oh. it's it's really hard for incumbents, especially, to actually undertake new technology or new trends because they don't understand it. They don't have the energy or the time to dedicate to new things. Um, mm. Right now in Brazil, we're seeing a lot of um, action on the tokenization space by mm. incumbents. We're seeing a lot of blue chip crypto being offered by some of the incumbents as well. Mm -hmm. But that is a reaction um, from the from the clients, right? From clients demanding and then the incumbents needing to actually go after and understanding what that is. Mm -hmm. um, so I I don't I don't think I agree, but there's nuance to this, right? Um, oh, if you compare to so you do it differently. You think Brazil yeah, is lagging. I, I, yeah, I don't I I've I've tried to I've been working in blockchain in Latin America since 2017. It's mm. five years since I started and I was with a massive company then. Um, it's only now that five years later that companies, especially mm. banks, are starting to pick up on what this means to them. And you know, now that we kind of dressed crypto as Web3 and you know added a bunch of appendages to it. Now it seems that people are willing mm. to have that discussion. But we've been doing this since late oh. 16, early 17. So it's not that it's just yeah. like, oh my God, this is happening so fast. Yeah. No, this has been in the works for some time, right? Yeah. So yeah, I, I think I think mass adoption is is slow. Mass adoption yeah. is difficult. I'm not I'm not even I'm not even saying mass adoption. I mean the incumbents that are starting to delve with it. Like it's just like four or five. And every and now every week someone says, oh we're gonna do that too because someone else is doing it. Right. So it's 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 mm -hmm. a really um, it's really a characteristic of um, Latinos, mm -hmm. I guess, is that's just, they're very like, mm, I'm not sure if I trust this. Let me see who else is doing so I can, you know, <laughs> at least learn from someone who's uh, messed up before me, uh, which is which mm -hmm. is fine. I mean, um, but I think there's another angle to this, which is emerging markets are massively mm -hmm. using crypto because their financial systems and their economic systems and the whole monetary policies don't work for the masses. So there's yeah. there's this one anecdote that uh, Vitalik Buterin, the uh, founder of Ethereum, went to Argentina last year, I think in December, and taxi drivers and waiters and regular people on the streets, they know him because they use Ethereum, because they don't want to use the banking system to move money around because they don't trust that the banking system is going to respect their money. So mm -hmm. there is a difference in having massive adoption by incumbents and being an option for people who are in emerging markets 
in need to protect themselves mm. from censorship or poor economic practices. So it's 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 a it's a very interesting dynamic. And the only reason why this is happening with crypto is because it's mm. permissionless. Anyone <laughs> can do that. As long as you have internet, you can use it. So that is very mm. powerful. And there's no incumbent or bank or central bank or government that it's going to tell you otherwise. It's permissionless. Yeah, you know, this part I totally agree. Um, it's because it's permissionless. So it, it has a, a lower entry barrier. So that's why like more people, especially those people who live in the emerging countries or markets, they, they, they will be able to get access to to the products that they don't have access before. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, why did you name it Block Drops? <laughs> well, because um, I'm I'm a dad, and I'm entitled to my dad jokes, right? Mm -hmm. And most of the dad jokes are, you know, playing with words and puns and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to talk about blockchain for business, and I wanted to be a news drops. Right, just you know, five minutes. This is what happened. Bang, bang, bang. Three, get out of the way. So it's just twenty minutes. Mm. So I said, you know what? That's the that's the name, right? Block drops. And then I looked around, and there wasn't a block drops podcast. There wasn't like block block drops, anything at the time. And I was like, yeah, let's just stick to it. Mm. And um, that's what it is. Um, I do have a um, an interview segment called Block Talks, where people talk about blockchain. And I felt that you know what. It's called block mm. drops. Might as well call the interview segment block talks because people come here and talk to me about blockchain. But that's as far as my sophistication mm. goes for giving stuff names. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Cool. You already worked on the block drops, your your podcast channel for almost three years. What are the three most important takeaways? What are your key lessons? Wow, that's that's a big question. Um, I think consistency. Uh, the fact that I never missed a week, kind of, you know, everyone that listens to the podcast kind of expects that it's going to come out on the weekend. Um, so I think that is kind of a one aspect that if, you, if you're consistent, you're going to build your audience organically and you're going to see the traction and you're going to see even cross pollination, like people asking me to go to their podcasts like we're doing now. Um, me going to events and even companies reaching out to me saying, Hey, I, I heard your podcast. Can you, you know, can we have a call? I'm having this type of situation that I wanted, you know, your advice on. And, and I'm a consultant. So I, I always try to kind of upsell my uh, skills and my knowledge to uh, companies and, and clients. So I think that's consistency is mm. something that is, you create some form of predictability. So I think that's also uh, a kind of a factor. Then I think um, you need to be true to what you know. There's a lot of things that I don't know, and I and I and I've and I said it in in, in some shows that I I studied enough uh, to do the episode, but I you know I really need to keep uh, digging in to learn more about uh, so and so subject. So I think being truthful to to what you are and who you are and what you know and and I think, you know, we're all learning. I don't think that there are experts in, in this industry. Um, you just know a little bit more than someone else. And there's obviously someone that's going to know about a specific subject more than you. And, you you know, that's, that's the whole, um, I think, being, you know, very uh, authentic um, is kind of a, you know, one factor, I think, that counts. And in the... Um, in the interviews aspect, I mean, in block talks, um, if I try to set up a call with my 88 guests one at a time and steal an hour from them, I probably wouldn't have 88 guests having a call with me. But if you call them and say, hey, I wanted to interview you for my podcast, they will come because they are interested in sharing and in, 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 uh, scaling their reach. So if you're in a call, it's just one-on-one. But if you're in a podcast, you're broadcasting your message to multiple other people that will then benefit from your knowledge, but also will 
now know you and, and get to know you through that. So I think this kind of exchange of interests really uh, and knowledge is what makes the format so powerful because I've had access to people that not in my wildest dreams I, I would be able to speak to and they willingly <laughs> came to the show. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful. And, and, and because of this kind of community that kind of builds around what I do with the podcast, um, it opened up a lot of doors uh, for me personally and professionally. So I think, yeah, the whole community and people aspect of it is uh, it's kind of a serious takeaway from, you know, two, I think two and a half years that I've been doing this. I completely agree with you on all those three points. Uh, I definitely think podcasts open open up a lot of doors. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, before I was always on the core team member or the funding team member side for crypto projects. So naturally I have a lot of connections. But after I started creating my podcast channel and I, after I started to reach out to people see, uh, to ask them, do you want to be on my podcast channel? And I, I received a lot of positive feedback before and after they have came on to my channel. <laughs> um, and I think this is a very supportive process or nurturing process because uh, not only I'm learning more by myself, but also I'm learning more from other people. And the more I talk to people, the more knowledge I accumulate. And then people are gonna see you are actually trying your best to deliver useful information to the broader audience. So, so they will they will admire your efforts too. <laughs> I mean, that's that's yeah. hoping that's the whole point about being genuine, right? If you're really trying and and if and if you're being genuine and asking the questions um, that will add to something, I think you know, why not give away one hour of your time? So yeah, I, I fully appreciate that. And and also it's an exchange, right? I mean, you're you're not just like, it's not just a microphone. There's two people actually having a conversation and coming up with Beautiful insights and, you know, yep. agreeing or disagreeing, but it doesn't really matter because what you're having is like human interaction, which is, you know, always what we kind of go for, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um... I think being a podcaster or a YouTuber, talking to different people, you you have to be very curious about different people's personality, their background, <laughs> so that like you can get a genuine conversation. If if I'm not naturally interested in those kind of things, I, I wouldn't be a good host, I think. <laughs> <laughs> for me as a new podcaster or YouTuber, do you have any suggestions for me? Oh my God, that's, that's even harder. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah, this is will be all drawn from, you know, personal experience because I'm, you know, I, I'm not a professional at this. It's, it's just the way I study. So it's for me, it's really hard to kind of put things into perspective because it's how I forced myself to actually understand the stuff that I'm reading over the week. So, yeah, but I think I think one thing, I mean, consistency, as I was saying, I think that is um, that is something that really adds up. Like this is like being 1% better every week. That really adds up. Uh, it compounds. So yeah, consistency is definitely something that if you can, even if it's not a weekly, if it's like a bi-weekly, if it's like a monthly, it doesn't matter. As long as you're doing, you know, your effort and you're like constantly uh, working on your craft, you can only get better, right? So I think that is, uh, maybe that's one kind of piece of advice. The second is, amplify like amplify just use social networks in your favor i usually i'm all on linkedin um more than i'm in any other platform which is for a crypto yeah, person is kind of weird because yeah crypto twitter is all you know all the rage and I, i'm all much wrong. more of an expectator yeah. on crypto twitter than i'm a person you know help me with the with the dialogue and the discourse Mm. Um, but on LinkedIn, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty active. Uh, I, I got support from, from a community in, on LinkedIn that is really responsive. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. tell you, have, uh, I think more than 10 K followers on, on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think I'm about to reach 13,000, um, which is really weird. I, I'm pretty sure I don't know 13,000 people like in person, <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but there's a lot of people that I never met that are active supporters of the work that I do mm. for no reason. Like they're just there. I mean, they're just like engaging and they are curious and they are supportive and they're like genuine humans. They're mm. not Twitter bots. <laughs> so maybe that's why uh, I kind of concentrate my um, my activity on LinkedIn because it's easier for me to kind of, you know, clean up the the, the feed and and um, and select who I engage with and and how. Um, but yeah, I'm, now that I'm now that I moved to London, I'm really hoping I can get to see and meet the people that are on my LinkedIn in real life because there's a lot of people that I never met in person that I would love to. But yeah, um, the whole community thing, I think Amplify That through the community is something um, really, uh, really special. And it kind of makes it worth it, right? Because I never, I didn't start the podcast to reach audiences and get 13,000 followers. That, was, that wasn't the plan in, in December of 19. It was just like, put the word out, tell the people what you're reading about and how you understand it and how useful blockchain is in those cases and or how useful blockchain isn't. And, you know, just uh, keep studying, which is like, it's what we can do for ourselves. Like studying, like knowledge is censorship resistant. So yeah, uh, just, <clears throat> I was saying that um, my intention was never to be a podcaster. It was, I saw a space that wasn't being filled by anyone in brazil or in the portuguese speaking world oh. the purpose of the podcast wasn't to reach audiences or be followed online it, mm. it had happened because in in a way i kind of filled a void uh, in the market mm. that people were when i started the podcasts that existed were talking about prices and fluctuations and chart analysis and i'm not interested in any of that i understand it because it's a part of the market but it wasn't my, it's still not my interest. I like what people are building with this. I like mm -hmm. to know how they're coming up with solutions, what types yeah, of problems they're solving there. and yeah. who's benefiting from them. I don't care how much money they're making flipping crypto. I really don't. What I care is who are you really benefiting? What are you solving? Because not everything needs a blockchain. Not everything needs a cryptocurrency. Not everything needs a token. But those cases where these things are needed, there are no other solutions. So I want to know about those, right? So that's why I started. And I kept going because the more you learn, the more you want to learn about these things. Because there's very smart people flowing into the market. Like mm. people that are much, much smarter than I are doing really, really great things. I want to know these people, right? So I think that was <laughs> kind of what kept me going for this long is that it only gets better. I'm, I've been into this studying this since 2014. There was no year since I started studying where the, the year was worse than the previous year. Every year is better. And I'm not talking prices. I'm talking about the use that are, we're doing with the technology globally. So of course. it the, can only the, get better. The, the fundamentals are moving. It's just whether essentially it's like I'm really looking forward to a moment that okay the the blockchain market or the blockchain industry gonna see a, a mass adoption, but of course before that we need to see all the fund fundamental infrastructure being built, a lot of great applications being built so that like average users they will be able to use those applications smoothly, which actually helps them to solve real world problems, right? Like 100%. adding new values to that, so so yeah, I 100%. I completely agree with you on, on that perspective, um, and I, I'm willing to be patient with this progress because I, I think I'm very lucky to 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 be also growing in in the <laughs> in the same space with a lot of smart people, yeah. diligent people. Yeah, absolutely. I I think my only difference to your perspective, I'm not willing to wait. I'm helping <laughs> to build this. So <laughs> I also mentor four startups that are building really cool stuff with blockchain. Oh. I, I advise clients that are big clients that are actively interested in building the new infrastructure of the internet with blockchain. So yeah, I'm not waiting. And, and I think we keep saying, oh, it's early, it's early. And people say it's early and think about, oh, it's cheap. 
that's not the early. It's early because there's a lot to be built yet. We're not starting. So I think yeah, when we um, say early, mm -hmm. it's because it's like we're in 1991. PFPs are jail cities of our time. So yeah, let's just build this thing. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying I'm, I'm just waiting. I'm, I'm also like contributing to the industry like from different perspectives. <laughs> Absolutely. I know initially your goal was not to become popular or to have a lot of followers creating a podcast. But as you have moved to, to the growth space or you are still trying to grow your audience, what kind of like brand pers personality or brand image are you trying to build as a podcaster? I, when, when I started this, it was like, honestly, just, you know, an effort to continue to get involved with the community. So I never thought about what type of brand I'm trying to project. I really think that I'm just, you know, over the average curious and, and maybe disciplined or a little stubborn. <laughs> But I, yeah, I have no idea. I just, you know, I just like the, the, the conversation. I like, I like to learn what smart people are building and I like to understand the things and, you know, maybe ask a few weird questions. Um, yeah, I'm overall weird. Maybe that's probably the best uh, description of what I project, but that's, that's not even intentional. I don't have a logo for my podcast. I've been doing this for two and a half years. And it's just mm -hmm. my photo that I took way back in the day with, you know, me on a black polo shirt. And then that's it. I mean, there's, that's no, there's no programming for that. I'm not trying to play with, um, you know, any psychology or try to entice or elicit any reactions. Uh, I just want people to listen if they're interested and maybe comment or interact online and maybe that will spark business. Um, but I'm not really trying to project anything. It's just, it's the way I study, and if it's helpful for someone else, yeah, I'm 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 super happy. If nobody nobody listens to it, and I'm still studying, and you know, that's that's fine too. I you know I'm not. That's not where uh, this thing is, is going. Obviously, I, I I'm super fortunate because everything I got from the podcast is completely disproportional to what I can give people through the podcast. Like it's not even comparable, right? Mm. The fact that I'm in London working for Eleven FS now, and I also have a podcast with 11FS because I had my own podcast. So the skills kind of transfer. It's to me is a ridiculous, completely outrageous uh, result of something that wasn't even planned. So mm. no, I have no idea what image I project. And I couldn't advise on that because that was never the case. Interesting. But what about your long-term goal? Like your long-term vision for your po podcast, do you just plan to, oh, because you like it, so you're going to continue build and build and build. Uh, do you aim to go somewhere? <laughs> like aim to <laughs> achieve well, some kind of milestones? I, I, yeah, I just moved to London, so I'm not planning going anywhere for a well, long time I'm not now. saying physical. <laughs> like um, but, milestone but, for podcast. Uh, that said, I really wish that the podcast is going to turn into a long living document of this era, of the things we did right, of the things we did wrong, of things that worked, of things that didn't, how things changed as this new industry matured. So I think, yeah, if I can think of a long-term legacy or long-term effect is, yeah, Mauricio did Block Drops podcast for however many years until this industry really took off and he documented everything that was interesting over time and people just go back and check oh my god they did that oh that's such a weird thing to think about now so maybe that's you know mm -hmm. like a one long-term um goal for the podcast is to be a living document of you know our era mm. okay <laughs> good to know me personally i have like very specific goals or milestones that I want to achieve. Uh, but but yours is certainly a very interesting perspective. <laughs> Again, it's it's I'm very fortunate. And I just, you know, that that I get to do what I do. So mm. everything else is icing on the cake. It's just the cherry on top. I'm very fortunate. And the podcast kind of helped me with that. And I just hope that this is useful for more people. And I hope that this kind of you know, helps us look in hindsight, like, I don't know, five years from now and say, oh, really, that's, that's how 
uh, immature we were, or that's, oh, this trend never went anywhere, or, oh my God, this is, you know, whatever crazy thing we do now, that's where this thing started. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, I, I, I won't know until we get there, but as we go along, I'm just, you know, marking the path every week with, uh, with my own, <laughs> with my own crumbles. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but you're right. It's a, it's a good documentary because um, when I look back my, the videos that I created two months ago, uh, I think I, I have been improving since then. Like ever since I created my first video, I will watch it. I will rewatch it maybe three or four weeks later to check like if there's anything I could do better. Um, so this is definitely like a self-documentary process or a self <laughs> process. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll tell you that I, I don't do that. I never listen to my episodes. I don't even listen to my episodes at the Blockchain Insider unless the media team at 11FS makes me do that because what? I hate my voice. Oh. I, I don't like how I look in video. And once that's done, it's one and done. <laughs> I don't re-record anything. It's five minutes, one breath, one news, next. Really? And I, I rarely go back to any of that thing. If I go back, it's just for the notes to see the links because I document everything. Um, every, every script is documented since day one. So I have a library of references that uh, I used for the shows uh, so I can go back and check. But that's mm -hmm. all in text form. It's on a Google Keep document. That's it. Mm -hmm. I'm not listening to myself. <laughs> okay. I, I really admire people who have the like the discipline to go and check. Oh, I could be better here, there, and I I'm not gonna put myself through that torture. <laughs> yeah, I think looking at yourself, listening to yourself is. I wouldn't say it's a torture, but it really takes patience. Because uh, cause if, if you start to repeat listening to yourself, right, you're going to repeat it again and again, maybe like three or four times. And each time you re you realize there's something you could improve. <laughs> but this is like an end. I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm too grumpy and too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's talk about the, I guess, the crypto content industry a bit, since like we are both content creators in this space. What do you think is most needed right now in, in Web3? What type of content? So we, um, we did an open mic night here in London uh, two weeks ago. Mm. And open mic is just me with the microphone, passing around, asking people questions. And, and the audience actually is talking about the, the topics. Mm. And one guy commented one thing that I had never heard. And I was like, that's that's it mm. one thing the guy said was you need to educate the news broadcasters because whether you like it or not they have a lot of influence on how this news that are happening in crypto get <laughs> to the mainstream audience yeah if you don't they will interpret their way and pass it on in their way and then ignorance propagates. And I was like, yes, that's it. That's what we need to do. So I think one thing that we need as an industry is actually engage with broadcasters like news hosts, TV news hosts, uh, journalists from you know, major newspapers, um, portals, what have you, and really get these guys and girls educated mm -hmm. in what this is because if, if you follow the headlines from the recent weeks, mm. they're calling Celsius DeFi. They're calling Galaxy <laughs> DeFi. You're, you're, just like, talking, you're talking about mainstream news. I mean, I think any like qualified crypto new, news channel, they wouldn't do that. Exactly. So if, if, if we have a guy on CNN telling, I don't know how many executives all across the world, regulators watching it, that Celsius is DeFi. Well, then it is because oh. it was on the news, right? So it becomes how people think about these things. Mm -hmm. And that's blatantly wrong. Who's going to educate them, right? So I think us as kind of crypto content creators and advocates of the industry, we need to probably, you know, do a better job at tackling specific audiences 
uh, in educating them so that the message that even if we have problems, I'm not saying that we're, we're trying to mask, you know, the problems that exist in the industry, which are being purged, thankfully. Mm. I think the way to tackle the problems is talking about them the right way. And calling everyone a Ponzi scheme is a disservice to everyone who isn't a Ponzi scheme. Calling everything DeFi is a disservice to, you know, all of the serious DeFi protocols, who, by the way, didn't get impacted by any of that. Mm. MakerDAO's working perfectly. Compound's working. Lido's working. Every Alve is working. Every serious protocol, every serious DeFi platform is working as designed with very interesting use cases being deployed every week that doesn't get headlines because these guys don't know what to look for, right? So I think that was the one thing that kind of really nailed it was that just go educate the news broadcasters because they're passing on weird information, wrong information, yeah. and that is not what we want to do. So yeah, that was kind of, I think if we are to do something right as advocates, I think that's that's probably the case. I think for mainstream news, mm, there are a lot of reasons why they behave that way. There might be regulation reasons. There might be pressure from the, the boards because it's all centralized decision process, right? And then there, I guess the news generating process is a black box to, to the average audience. Well, but, so, then the, but then the excuse is not, they don't know better. <laughs> yeah, they don't know better. That's for sure. So, so that's why like we are having so many independent crypto decentralized news channels, crypto content creators. Mm, it's just, I, I think it's just a matter of time that people are gonna understand more accurate information yeah. about the, the Web3 space. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I, I think, I think in, in, in that same perspective, if we want to accelerate this, we need to go where the, the news are uh, amplified and, and these are the broadcasters. So I think, yeah, I think, yes, native crypto news are great because we speak the language, but my mom yeah, and my dad we, we won't go to the defiant for news, right? <laughs> I think we definitely need to be the, the force for the change. Um, if anything, like I, I'm trying to do is I, I always try to be neutral. I always try to pass accurate information with with data, with, with fact. Mm -hmm. fact. And as an industry, I think we love a jargon. Like, oh my God, we have so many expressions <laughs> and internal jokes and it's super niche, right? Mm. People don't understand memes from an industry they don't understand. So I think it's really important to kind of de-jargonize it, break it down into like biteable pieces so people can understand what we're talking about, what are the implications. And when they see something on the news, mm. they'll say, mm, that's not exactly it. But that takes a long time. But if the news, which is the amplifier, is well-educated, they have one last excuse of calling Celsius DeFi. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, 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 I agree with you. Um, so let's all try together. Um, I'm very positive and and I I'm very like optimistic about this actually. Yeah, yeah, on me, on me too. I I I want to you know leave it for the record. If you're a broadcaster and you're listening to this and you want to learn more about crypto, hit hit us up. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll take a call with you and walk you through what this is and tell you that Celsius is not a DeFi protocol. <laughs> I guess after you created so many different episodes, have you checked like which one is the most popular one? So there's one very early where I talk about credit risk ma being managed on chain. Mm. It's not even tokenized credit risk. It's just that credit risk data. Mm. There was there was a hit like over, I think over 500 plays total lifetime. Yeah. But the one guest that had the fastest and the uh, the highest play count was Paul Brody from EY. Mm. Paul was he he's he's amazing obviously but um and he's and he's on a big platform like EY so when and he was able to actually you know propagate a lot of the episodes. Yeah. So yeah he's he's the best uh block talks or the the, the most played block talks 
um, in all time. And then this one episode about credit risk is always risk is always something that traditional uh, bankers and TradFi people will kind of want to look into because that's their daily lives. So I think mm. that was one. Uh, it was like one of the maybe February uh, 2020, like pre-COVID. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I have a steady um, audience of around 300 people. It varies a little bit. Uh, now that I, um, I'm only in Portuguese, it's obviously dropping because I kind of mm-hmm. lost my English um, viewers. Oh, yes. yeah. um, but I'm hoping they migrate to Blockchain Insider because that's where my English content is now. Hopefully, your new channel with 11F is gonna gonna grow a lot. Oh, it's they 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 really didn't need me. It's just it's it's a massive podcast by its own right. Uh, they've been running this since 2017 mm. uh, with a hiatus, I think, during um, 19 or 18. Mm. Um, but it's it's one of the best run shows, and I'm I'm really privileged to be hosting uh, Blockchain Insider. This is certainly one of the uh you know high points of my podcasting career <laughs> uh, they have they have uh, i think the total count of uh episodes lifetime is over two million plays mm-hmm. it's like really ridiculous numbers mm-hmm. um i'm yeah i'm you know i i was uh i was pretty much a hundred x when i uh took over um hosting duties uh at blockchain insider so yeah very mm-hmm. lucky to be there Talking about, I guess, blockchain podcast. Podcast. What well, do you have any favorite ones? Like, let's recommend to our audience. Like, yeah, what, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do. So, um, I'll list a few because it's it's really hard to, um, and 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 I love to do this because I am very fortunate that I have uh, a lot of curation from the content that I receive because my network is really really good. Um, so I'm I'm more than happy to kind of share the same curation uh, forward. Um, I, I obviously would recommend, you know, Blockchain Insider because it's my new baby. Um, but I like the Bankless a lot. Like Me these too. guys are really <laughs> smart, David yeah. and Ryan. So I, yeah. So they I, are uh, fast too. Yeah. Like, yeah. They are fast on, on content. Oh, yeah. Of absolutely. Course they, they scaled a lot. So that's why. And, and roll, up, roll Up is probably my favorite um, piece of news um, every, every, every Friday or Saturday. So it's, you go for a walk, you go for a run, you have one hour plus of content that is really digestible. So mm-hmm. I think that's uh, that's one angle. Um, I really like the Bankless guys. Um, the other side um, with uh, Chase Chapman, uh, mm-hmm. she's, she's a great interviewer. Uh, she knows her stuff. The people she brings to the show is like pretty solid people. So yeah. I, I really like... Um, you know the the way she tackles and and, and the episodes vary like if she if she f- feels that the conversation is like 25 minutes enough she'll cut it down to 25 minutes if it's an hour it's an hour um mm. and she's very smart so i uh, i really like uh, listening to uh, the other side um i think these probably uh, Laura Shin uh Laura Shin is uh, yeah. uh, like a like Forbes podcast, former yeah. Forbes journalist she has unleashed which is a newsletter plus a podcast and unchained unchained Unchained. that's right that is now you to prove you as a super (laughs) fan yeah she's oh my god she's wild yeah she and she has access to everybody like if you think about someone in the crypto space she's interviewed them like that's that's how badass she is um so that is uh i think the top three in my mind Um, And I would maybe throw in a few newsletters. Um, I personally like, from the top of my mind, three newsletters that I would recommend, eyes closed. Um, Fintech Brain Food by Simon Taylor. Mm. Um, He's one of the co-founders of 11FS. Now he's the head of strategy and content at Sardine. Great writer, mental model, wizard, love his writing style. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I I cop his shit all the time. So yeah, that's one. Uh, Luca Prosperi. Luca is an advisor to MakerDAO and a lot of other crypto funds. Mm. Uh, former banker, um, knows a great deal of macro, microeconomics, writes beautifully, has a great story of life, mm. and he's a personal friend. So I couldn't recommend it more. Um, and then uh, Not Boring 
by Pecky McCormick. Mm. Great style writer, um, very snarky, very intelligent, um, great questions, um, great researcher. Uh, and I think that, you know, these are, if you're, if you're only going to get three newsletters to a deserted island, these are the three <laughs> newsletters I would recommend. Um, well, Crypto Deserted Island, <laughs> I would recommend these uh, three um, authors because they are really, really smart. Okay. Thank you for the recommendation. Maybe next time when I go to your channel, I will give mine. <laughs> Um, but but I think for the podcast channel wise, uh, we are very similar. Yeah. Um, and then now I think we reached our last part, which is you have to share a fun fact about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> a fun fact. I'm not sure if it's fun. I don't know. Uh, maybe a curious fact. So um, I'm Brazilian, born and raised. I've been playing drums for 30 years. I'm not great at it, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm stubborn. Um, I've been with Versover, my band, for 25 years. Hmm. Um, so it's been quite the ride. I'm married with two kids, two teenagers, two cats. I collect the utmost non-fungible art. <laughs> tattoos tattoos <laughs> <laughs> that's really non-fungible yeah um what else i do crossfit um i mentor for startups i work at 11fs i mean that's kind of there's not there's nothing you know fun but yeah that's uh maybe that's who i am that's your life yep yeah but i but, but i think um you you mentioned again and again you feel you are very fortunate because you, I am. you get to do what you like. You get a very <laughs> lovely family and everything. And and I, I I wish you can grow your podcast channel exponentially and we can shape the industry together like we and we as want. long as I don't have to listen to myself, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I will continue to listen because <laughs> um I, I guess like that's my own like mechanism of improving. If I don't do it, oh, I I I I fully appreciate that, and I know that I would probably be much better if I did that. I just can't stand myself. That's <laughs> that's a limitation. I see. But anyways, thank you so much for joining my podcast today. I I really learned a lot. Thank and you. I, like we are very different podcasters or content creators in terms of a lot of different perspectives, but essentially um we we share similar goals in terms of moving the crypto content industry forward educating people better presenting people with the the better news not the better news but the more accurate information to them that's 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 the core goal for yeah, us yeah i agree i think we i mean we're we're living such an interesting time in the industry that it's really hard not to be optimistic about it. And mm -hmm. I, I try to sprinkle a little bit of skepticism. So when I see something that's really, really good, I kind of ask myself, what's wrong with this? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not trying to spoil the fun. I'm just thinking that if we're, we're, we are to innovate seriously, this curiosity and optimism needs to be paired with a little bit of skepticism and pragmatism mm -hmm. because then we're serious about it, right? Uh, mm. We don't live in a world of, you know, unicorns and roses and, you know, fluffy sky. That's that's not reality. Mm. So we need to be a little bit more serious about what we're trying to pursue. So, yeah, if we strike that, you know, cool balance, we'll, we'll get there. Thank you, Mauricio. Let's say goodbye to our audience. Bye. Bye. <laughs>